So thank you very much. Uh, so here we are at Elul. I, I always um, uh, think, when I think of Elul, uh, two uh, scents, fragrances enter my mind. When I smell vinegar and honey cake. Honey cake, because my mother, Leah Scholl, used to bake amazing honey cake for, uh, for Rosh Hashanah, uh, for us and for a bunch of friends in, uh, back in Australia. And uh, vinegar, because my father, Oliver Scholl, uh, used to blow shofar in our shul, and uh, I'm not exactly sure what the lot, but he used to he used to clean the shof, shofar out with vinegar before. So when I smell vinegar and I smell honey cake, I, like in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, Rosh Hashanah. Uh, I, I think probably uh, they may have some symbolic meaning as well, because Rosh Hashanah has a certain duality to it. On the one hand, it's a day of judgment. Uh, we are being judged, criticised, critiqued, evaluated. Uh, our, our license is coming up for renewal, uh, etc. Uh, but on the other hand, we celebrate. We eat good food. We dress nicely. We uh, we actually celebrate. So uh, there's a duality to it. There's both the vinegar and there's the honey. There is the, what we call din, justice, and there's also the love of Hashem. So even though, in, the, in fact, the commentaries on the Shulchan Or of the Code of Jewish Law point this out, that uh, um, even though we are coming to judgment, not usually a court case, not usually an occasion for, for happiness or joy, uh, not usually a time when you are, woo, you know, let's, uh, let's go. Uh, however, if the judge is your father, you're okay. Right. So that's what we, uh, that's what we come in with that knowledge that Hashem loves us, He is our Father, and uh, consequently there's a mixture of, the, uh, of both, both emotions. What I want to talk about is, is Elul, which we're still in the, in, the, in the end, we're at the end of Elul now, and there are a number of allusions to Elul that you find in our tradition, and two of them strike me as a little strange, just a little, little weird, right, they don't strike me as Elul. Elul is hinted at at the uh, with the uh, first letter of each word of the verse in Shir Ashir in Song of Songs, Ani Ladadi Badadi Li, I am to my beloved, my beloved is to me. Now, if I would ask you to do a word association, Elul, so would you say Elul, love, or would you say Elul, fear, Elul, awe, or Elul, affection? I don't know. Most people I know. Um, maybe I hang out with Litvux too much, but uh, then associate Elul with, not with love, but we tend to associate Elul with reverence, awe, fear, etc. And here, one of the allusions to Elul is Anila Doidi, but Doidili, I am to my beloved, my beloved is to me. Now, that is not as strange as the next one. The next one really strikes me as weird, because the next one is actually from Megillah Esther. Megillah Esther, Scroll of Esther, which we read on Purim, there's an allusion, a remez, a hint to Elul in the Scroll of Esther, which is, Ish l'reyehu umatano islev yoyim. A person shall give gifts to his friend and presents to the poor. Ish l'reyehu umatano islev yoyim spells, first letter of each word, forms an acrostic of Elul. So, if the first one was strange, this one is like on the scale of strangeness even higher. Right? I mean, what gifts to, the, gifts to each other, presents, um, it, it doesn't strike me as something. You may, you may give the kids presents on Rosh Hashanah so they don't, you know, just to bribe them so they can sit a shul for a little longer, right, to not vandalize the shul, etc. But, but the idea that Elul is alluded to in this concept of, of giving presents to each other uh, strikes me as, uh, as counterintuitive. So, in order to understand this, so, and by the way, one of the customs we have, one of the minhagi we have during Elul and the 10 days of repentance, Aser Simei Tshuva, is in fact, doesn't, it's not so strange because one of the customs is to increase in giving, to give more tzedakah, charity, to do more acts of chesed, kindness. It was actually a few years ago in New York that was in winter. Uh, at rapidly approaching, although hard to feel it now. But I was on Madison Avenue. It was my first came to the States in 2001, I think it was. I'm on Madison Avenue, gave, gave a shear there, and there had been freezing rain followed by snow. The worst possible combination, you could write. 
Freezing rain, snow. So no traction whatsoever. I'm walking out of the place I was given in class carrying a laptop and a projector and uh, expensive equipment. And I walk out, and as I step onto the sidewalk, I'm Australian. I'm not used to snow. Right? I, lived in Australia, I grew up in Australia. We never, ever have snow in any of our cities, ever. If you want snow, you go to the snow. In Australia, we talk about, oh, you're going to the snow? That means you go to the mountains where you make a choice about snow. It doesn't come to you against your will like it does here. Right? So, and, uh, so I, 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 I wasn't used to it. So I just walked as I normally would walk. And I basically started to fall. And a guy, a complete stranger, grabs me and helps me up, like stops me from falling. I said, oh, wow, thank you so much. He said, no problem. Where are you going? I said, well, my car's right here. So he says, hey, let me help you. So I, was, I mean, it's New York. I didn't want him to carry the stuff, but you know, whatever, <laughs> right? But he seemed like a nice guy. He helped me carry the stuff to the car. And he says, do you need directions? I hear you've got a foreign accent. I said, well, no, thanks very much. I, yeah, I actually live in New Jersey. I'm, I'm OK. I, but really, a very just nicest guy, amazing. And I notice, as he's you know, saying, like, OK, drive safely, I see he's got a medallion. And the medallion is a pentagram. Now, I'm not sure if you're aware of this. But a pentagram is a type of star which is a symbol of the Church of Satan. Right? <laughs> You probably don't have a lot of people with pentagrams around here. I don't know what, how big is the Church of Satan in Forest Hills. I'm not so sure. I, I, they probably struggle for a minion. Right? <laughs> Sorry. For a coven. Sorry. Anyway, so I see he's got a pentagram. And actually, around the pentagram, it actually says Church of Satan. So I couldn't, I couldn't resist. I said, I said, really, I really thank you so much for helping me. Uh, are, are you actually a member of the Church of Satan? And he said, yeah, I am. I said, but you're so nice. He said, oh, I'm not religious. <laughs> um, in, in Torah, um, in Judaism, uh, that, uh, part of being religious is actually you are helping, you're supposed to help and give, be nice. And we actually, when it comes to Elul and the 10 days of repentance, one of the things we try to do is reach a little beyond where we normally are, extend ourselves. Uh, to give, to do kindness, an extra smile, extra welcome, etc., etc. So, uh, so therefore, it's not so strange that Elul should be alluded to in the verse, one man to his friend and gifts to the poor. But I think it might need further explanation. So, in order to understand this, I want to look at the in the book of Kings. So we have the famous story of Elisha. Elisha was a prophet, he used to travel around Israel and, uh, and speak to people and, and, and uh, I guess do what prophets do. You know. So uh, he'd go around Israel and speak. And when he came to a place called Shunam, he used to stay. There was a woman, a Shunammite woman, who hosted him. She and her husband hosted Elisha. And Elisha, and, and they decided, you know what, uh, he comes here every year, let's build him. They built him a little guest room, Elias Kir Katana. They built a little guest room. They put a bed in there, obviously a kosher lamp, right? And uh, all these standard things, right, that, that one requires, right? And um, they made a guest room for him, and, and he was very happy about it. And he was quite appreciative. So he came to this woman, the Isha Shunamis, and he says, he says, um, it says, by Yom, and it was on the day. The other Elisha El Ashunamis, he came to this Shunamite woman and he said, You know, I really appreciate everything you've done. I'll say, Bayah Yom, Bayah for Elisha El Shunam. And he says, Bayah for Shama, Bayah El Haaliyah. He went into his attic, his little uh, 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 area that he rested. Bayah El Gechazi, Karal Shunamis Azois. He said to his lad, Call this lady here. And she stood there, Bayah El and he said, Omar El he says, um, you did a lot of stuff for us. We really, I really appreciate all the, all the uh, stuff that you've done for me. Can I speak to the king for you? He offers, protects him. Right? Important in Israel, even back then. 
So he says, Hayesh Lach Ladabra I mean, look, he was a prophet. He was an important man. Obviously, he was tight with the king. Um, and uh, he says, Can I speak? Hayesh Lach Ladabra Lamelech, or Lazara Tzava, or to the minister of war. And her response is very strange. Her response is, the Soich Ani Anoichi Yoshevs, the Yoshevs. I am dwelling amongst my people. Because sometimes, you know, you ask someone something and the response is like, totally like, you, you can answer my question. You know, uh, I, I say, um, how big is that? Uh, you know, uh, is, that, is that chicken soup? And you'll say, it's actually a, a piece of soup about this long. Right? <laughs> I mean, we, we, we're not communicating. He says, can I speak to the king for you? And she says, I'm dwelling amongst my people. Well, I know that. Elisha knows that. She's living in Israel in Shunam. What exactly is she telling him? So here, the Zohar tells us a fascinating explanation, a hidden explanation of this verse. The Zohar says the following. It says, Hayom refers to Rosh Hashanah. It was Rosh Hashanah when he was there in Shunam, in this place. And when he said to this woman, Hayeshlach Ladabri Amel, can I speak to Hamel? Right? Can I speak to the king? Who was he re- to whom was he referring? God. Hamelech Hakodlish. Hamelech, how we refer to Hashem on, on Rosh Hashanah. And so he says, Can I speak to the king for you? So so this the Zohar is putting it in a very, very interesting context. He's not asking if I can get your property tax reduced. He's not saying, can I speak to the king, get some parking things put outside the house, but, you know, like people blocking your driveway because of mincha, whatever. No, that's not what it's about. He's actually saying, can I speak to the king of kings, the holy one, blessed be he. Okay, so now we understand his question. But her response is still slightly off. Her response is, Besoichami, Anoshi Yoshavis, I'm dwelling amongst my people. So the Zohar explains this beautifully. The Zohar says, on Rosh Hashanah, a person should never ever desire to be looked at as an individual. I do not want to be looked at as an individual. I want to be looked at as part of Ami. Ami That's what she was saying to Liz. She says, don't mention me to Hashem especially in your prayers. That's like, Hashem, please, this Shunammite woman, no, I don't want that, she says. I don't want that. I only want to be mentioned amongst the whole Jewish people. Not as a separate entity, not as an individual, but as part of the Jewish people. The Soch Ami, I know who your is. And the Zohar goes on to say that a person should be very careful, and the Gemara actually says this quite explicitly, a person should be very careful to pray with the community on Rosh Hashanah. Even though during the year we try to pray with a minion, you start that a person should attempt to daven with a minion when you can. Right? However, right, on Rosh Hashanah it is especially important. Why? Because in as much as it's the day of judgment, we don't want to have our head above the crowd. We don't want to be looked at individually. We want to be looked at as part of the community. Very important. And, and the Zohar says that actually will help in our judgment on Rosh Hashanah. So, so we see the importance of community there in the sense that obviously our merit as individual is as a certain merit. But if I'm part of the community, that, even, that helps me even more. And, and why is that so? Uh, and, and I should point out also that our prayer especially, when especially since on Rosh Hashanah, most of what we do is pray. I mean, I once said to a non-Jewish friend, I was back in Australia, I remember I was a teenager in Australia, and I was part of a squash club. That's, that's nothing to do with zucchini or anything like that. The squash is like a, it's a racket game you play inside a court. It's like racket ball. Anyway, so I was in this squash club, and I said, I said to my friend, listen, I'm not going to be here, uh, you know, on, uh, on whatever it was, Monday, Tuesday. He said, why not? I said, it's the Jewish New Year. He said, oh, uh, fair enough, mate. He says, so Monday is the New Year's, Tuesday is recovery. <laughs> I say, no, actually, we have two days New Year. He says, whoa, you Jews, unbelievable. What stamina. Like, he was very impressed. Two days New Year's. That's unbelievable. I mean, you've got to be blasted. Oh, my God. I said, no, no, no. no, no, no. You don't have to me explain here, Damien. Right? Let me explain. I said, we spend most of the time praying. And when we're not praying, we're eating. 
<laughs> he says, well, really? I said, yeah. He says, you do this for two days? I said, we do this for two days. Right? Now, he's not so impressed at this point. Right? He was very impressed if we would be drinking like <laughs> sailors for two days. That is impressive. But we're praying. But so what do we spend most of our time doing on Rosh We pray. So the tefillah is really the main thing. And the tefillah, the prayer, is especially important that it should be as part of a community. And I'd like to explain why that is so. Because by the way, even during the year, I look around this room, this is, uh, you know, the Gemara says in Brothers that Lo'ola is paro adam bebeis sheyesh bof halonimos. You should always pray in a place with windows. A house with windows. There's a window, right? In a house with windows. So the Gemara was against the max. Uh, so anyway, so you should pray in a house with windows. Right? And there, it's interesting, if you look at the Rashash, Rishmul Strasson, who was a, a businessman and a great scholar in Vilna, he asks, he says, but the big shul in Vilna doesn't have windows. And he says, the second biggest shul in Vilna, the windows are so high up, you can't see out them anyway, so what's the use? He says, I don't get it. How are we in Vilna ignoring the Gemara, the Talmud, which says, stipulates, you should always pray in a place with windows. And all the shuls in Israel, I mean, I used to go to a shul in Haradoff, which was in a bomb shelter. There were no windows, right? It was safe, but there were no windows, right? So, I had, so the, Rashash, the Rashash quotes a letter from the Rambam, Maimonides, who says that the requirement for windows is only if you're praying in your own home. If you're in a shul, you don't need windows. And the Prima Gavin rules in accordance with that. So in other words, the Gemara says you should have, you should always pray in a house. And actually, it sounds like because the Gemara doesn't say Lo Olam Yipalel Adam Bebeit Knesset Sheyesh Bo Chalonot. Pray in a shul with when it says Lo Olam Yipalel Bebeit Sheyesh Bo Bebeit means what? A house. So, so according to this, if you're in a private house, you're praying at home, you need windows. If you're in a shul, no windows. That's how the Rambam rules, that's how the Trimagari rules. What's the explanation? So I think the explanation, I, I mean, Ruf Cook, in his commentary on the Siddur called Olas Ria, Ruf Cook has an amazing understanding. He says, you know why you need windows? Because prayer can never be only about yourself. He says, so when you have windows and a connection to the outside world, hopefully your consciousness will be expanded to include other people as well. When you don't have windows, you're focused on yourself. According to Ruf Cook, it makes complete sense now. If I'm praying at home alone, then I must have windows because I need something to help me make me aware of other people. If I'm praying in the shul with other people, I don't need windows. Why? Because I'm aware of other people there. The annoying guy who shuffles in his belt always hits a stender and the only thing you can hear during Shwan Asher is click, click, click. Or the guy whose chair is creaking. It's okay. yeah, all those annoying things, you're aware of other people. You're aware of other people. I'm aware of other people in this room. However, in a positive way, you don't need the windows because you're aware of other people's existence. That is the essence of what prayer is about. Yeah. It doesn't matter. As long as it's windows, it's a reminder. It's a reminder to you, right? Probably open on it, right? But but you see, the idea of the idea of of filler, especially on Rosh Hashanah, especially during Elul, is very much tied in with with community. And why is that so? I want to give you a number of reasons. First of all, if we pray for the Jewish people, for others, and for all of us. In a sense, we are praying for, for God because the Jewish people are his representatives in this world. And therefore, if we are praying for the peace of the Jewish people, for the security of the Jewish people, for the prosperity of the Jewish people, for the health of the Jewish people, the success of the Jewish people, really, that's as though we're praying for God himself. Because we are praying for his shlichim, his representatives, his people, or as I would say, his peeps. Right, we are praying, street youth language, right, we are praying for God, in a sense. If I'm praying just for myself, as an individual, not necessarily representing Hashem, but as an entire community, 
We are indeed representing God. And therefore, praying for our needs and the needs of the Jewish people is actually praying for God. And actually, halakhically speaking, there's a fascinating law. You know, on Shabbos, you're not supposed to do business. You're supposed to talk about business. You're not supposed to talk about any commerce. You're not even supposed to mention uh, price of something, even if you say, even if you say that, you're not allowed to do it. You know, that? it's like saying, it's like you're about to have some lobster. Nip lobster, right? And then I'm going to have, it doesn't work. It doesn't work, right? So say, not to say, like, but, right, doesn't work. Like, the guy comes to shul. He says, the guy's Friday night. He says, listen, and says, I'm selling my, nip shabbos correct, but I'm selling my car. And the other guy says, nip shabbos correct, but how much are you offering? How much do you want? He says, nip shabbos correct, 10. He says, nip shabbos correct, I'll, I'll give you eight. He says, I'll get back to you. He comes home. Sitting with a meal with his wife, he says, "Listen, this shop is He offered me eight. She says, "She says this shop is great, not a penny less than nine." <laughs> Comes back, Shachris. He says to the guy, "This shop is great. We'll take nine. <laughs> the other guy says, "This shop is great. I'll give you eight five. <laughs> Goes home for lunch. Talks to his wife. She says, "She says, you know what? It's on. Oh, okay. Okay, this shop is great." She says. Uh, he comes back to shul and uh, well, well, right. he comes back to shul and he tells the guy, "Okay, can you show us the rent? He says, "I'll take eight five. The guy says, uh, 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 "He says, "I'll give you eight five. The guy says, "This show us the rent. I already sold it." Anyway, <laughs> but, but it doesn't really it doesn't really help, right? So anyway, however, we have an interesting exception to that. When you come to shul and uh, and you get a mishabar or something. Right. Are you allowed to say the, uh, a, a number? Are you allowed to say how many dollars, etc.? Of course you are. In fact, we have, you can have a communal meeting even on Shabbos. And at the communal meeting, we can decide all types of physical needs. If we'd be in Israel, right, or we'd be some, some, yeah, some, some small village, Jewish village in Israel, we could have a meeting about repairing the roads, and we can have the meeting on Shabbos. We could have the meeting about garbage collection. We could do it on Shabbos. Why? Because the Talmud says, Tzorchei Rabin, the needs of the community, is considered to be not, your, not our needs, but Chefzei Shamayim, meaning the needs of heaven. God is concerned with the community. So even the physical needs of the community are considered to be like a mitzvah. So even though, even though I'm discussing, we're discussing financial arrangements, we're discussing dollars and cents, we're discussing amounts of money, we're discussing stuff that we're going to do during the week. <coughs> if what we are discussing is a communal need, that is considered to be chefzei shamayim, the needs of heaven. And that is one idea of the communal aspect of El Elul and the communal aspect of Rosh Hashanah. So when we pray for others, we pray for the whole community, then even though it doesn't sound like we're praying for anything lofty or ephemeral, etc., I'm praying for simple things. So-and-so should get a job, so-and-so should get a shit of, so-and-so should, should get their lease signed. I mean, all ties up. But you know what? If it's the whole community I'm thinking about, then that's actually a godly need. That's divine. That's spiritual. That's chefzei shamayim, meaning the desires of heaven, not just chefatzecha, chefatzecha, not just my needs. In addition, the Tanya points out that God is, in as much as God is one, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Hashem Echad, we describe God as Hashem Echad, God is oneness, absolute unity, oneness, etc. He says, therefore, he chooses only to dwell in oneness, meaning he will only dwell or rest his divine presence or manifest his divine presence amongst those who are truly united. If people are not united, they do not form an appropriate kli, a utensil, in order for God to dwell there. God only dwells in a utensil which is a utensil which is united, which is a one. Because uh, the lights attract, so to speak. So therefore the divine presence, the Shechina, which as he puts it, Ratzah Kodesh God wants to rest his divine presence in this lower world, 
He says that is only in a Jewish people who are united. I had an amazing experience this summer. Um, I did a lot of traveling this summer. I spent 124 hours in planes over the summer. It was in Australia twice, South Africa once. And uh, it was just a, a crazy. But Baruch uh, Hashem, mostly good. So I was in South Africa uh, to speak. They have something there called the Indaba, Sinai Indaba. Indaba, as you all know, is a Zulu word, uh, which means a great gathering. So the Sinai Indaba, instituted by the chief rabbi of South Africa, Warren Goldstein, is an attempt to get all Jews together to learn some Torah together one day. So in that in Johannesburg, which is the largest Jewish population, Cape Town, and Durban. Durban is only about 2,000 Jews. Cape Town is about 30,000 Jews. Uh, sorry, Cape Town's about 15,000 Jews. Johannesburg, probably about 30,000. So it was at the Santon Convention Center, and there are a number of speakers there. Um, and uh, on Monsey Shah, a Saturday night, it started with the Malava Malka. Each of us gave a 10 minute talk. And on Saturday night in Johannesburg, 4,500 people came. 4,500 people. During the course of Sunday, 6,000 people came. I gave two classes on Sunday, each class 3,500 people. It was quite something. And what was most beautiful about this was that all the sectors of the community got together to do it together. There was Chabad, there were Litvaks, there were religious Zionists, there were Yeshivish Litvaks, Haredim, there were, Chas there were Sfarim, there were Ashkenazim. It's an amazing thing. They all got together on this. All got together. It was, it was the most beautiful thing about it was not just giving a class. The beautiful thing about it was experiencing in a sense of amazing unity. You know, people are feeling that, that what they've got in common is their Jews. I have a, a neighbor who has a book. He has a great collection of books. One of his books is from a rabbi in Newark, New Jersey. Not contemporary, right? Uh, there was a Jewish community in Newark, apparently, and this was in the 1930s, I think. And the rabbi wrote in the introduction to his book, he says, I don't understand it, he says. In America, there are people from all 70 nations and 70 languages. The only thing they have in common is they're American citizens, and they're all able to be in the same school. He says, we Jews, he says, we keep Shabbos. And we dub together. And we, we keep kosher. We have the same Torah. We have the same heritage. We have the same background. We have the same language. And every group has to have their own school and their own shul and their own zone. Unbelievable. He says something we can learn from America. I don't know if it's still true today, but I mean, so it's still to a certain degree. Right? And, but one of the most beautiful and inspiring things about that was having this incredible sense of unity. Uh, in, in that community in South Africa, which was, which was very beautiful. And I just felt, when I saw that, the words of the Tanya, who says that that is where the Shekhinah rests. The Divine Presence truly rested there in the, in the convention center in Santon, in Joburg, uh, because, because there was this amazing sense and feeling of unity, and actual unity, people coming together. So that is a, that is a, a second idea. Idea number three, the Meshach Chochma, Rav Meir Simcha of Dvinsk, explains, very interesting, he says this, we know, as I mentioned before, that there's a custom to increase in the giving of charity and to increase in acts of kindness. Why specifically these areas? I mean, uh, is it not appropriate to start being stringent in every area? Maybe we should all, uh, all be stringent in other areas as well. Why is it that there appears to be a custom specifically, charity and kindness? So his answer is the following. Let me tell you a let me tell you a weird and wonderful halacha. It's not so weird, but it's the, the you know there's a there's a law which is you know that eat from the fruit of a of a tree in the first three years of its growth. It's called orla. So if you plant a tree in your backyard and it produces fruit first, second, third year, can't have it. It's called orla. Prohibited. Outside of Israel, as a doubt of orla is permitted. That's why you let it go into a store and just buy fruit without thinking about it. However, in Israel, a doubt of Orla is prohibited. So you have to have a little sign, Machne Yehuda, there'll be a sign, Gli, Shash, Tevel, Orla, etc. No problem. Actually, uh, my sister-in-law uh, came from Israel, visited us, she brought me a receipt from the supermarket 
on the printed computer receipt from the supermarket, it had next to the different vegetables what their status was regarding Schmitter, the sabbatical year. So, so that you know how to deal with them. I thought that was quite beautiful to see on your printed receipt from the, from the supermarket next to these vegetables it says, it says uh, uh, Kibush Ezra and these ones it says, it says uh, Yivu Mechutzaris and these ones it says Kudushat Shi'it. Beautiful, most beautiful receipt I've ever seen from a supermarket, especially since it wasn't something I had to pay for. Anyway, so, uh, so the law is with Orla that you cannot eat from this tree first three years. So supposing I've got a tree in my backyard, a fruit tree, and it's been producing fruit, fruit for 10 years, so I'm quite happy with it. My gardener comes to me one day, he says, he says, Rabbi Beth, I've got some good news. I had your tree, I grafted onto it a branch, a couple of branches from the other tree in your yard to, you know, hopefully to help the fruit, you know, grow, grow a bit of fruit. I said, well, well, what tree did you grow up branches on from? He says, you know, that new tree that you had in the backyard? I said, what, you mean the two-year-old tree? He says, that's one. I said, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> right? I mean, what, he, so he basically took, took branches from the, from the prohibited tree, which is Orla, right, two years old, grafted it onto my wonderful old tree, and now I, and I said, is it possible to identify the branches? He said, that's the good news, Rabbi. <laughs> they took, they took, they grew up, they, they grew into it perfectly. You cannot even tell which branches are from the new tree, which branches are from the old tree. Isn't that fantastic? And I say, I, I'm not sure I need to ask my Rabbi if that's fantastic or not. So, uh, you know, it's not the type of question that comes up too often. So, yeah, you find a Rabbi. So, what is the halacha? What's the law? The law here is quite interesting. The halacha is that the young tree that was grafted onto the older tree is actually nithar, it is purified by being grafted onto the older tree. It says, Yalda Shinsalham is Kena, the Talmud gives a, a, a very beautiful expression, and what it basically says is that, the, that by attaching those branches to the older tree, you've purified those branches. So the, and we have another halacha, similar halacha. You are making a mikvah. So the mikvah has to be with water, which is, which is not poured in using a utensil, doesn't come in through metal pipes and stuff like that. So let's say you don't have enough rainwater to fill a mikvah, 700 liters, 750 liters or whatever it is, right, every day. It's not going not gonna to happen, right? Monsoon season in Singapore, maybe. But in general, you don't have that much rain. So what do we do? We do what's called hashaka. You have your regular water, and then, then you, have a, you have a storage storage basin of rainwater. And then when you, you remove a stopper and the waters touch, and what happens to the water? It is purified by making contact with the oitzar, with the, with the storage tank of rainwater. In the same way that the young branches are purified by being grafted onto the older tree. So Mesha Chochma says, he says, each one of us, if we graft ourselves onto the trunk of the Jewish people, we can purify ourselves. If we are distant, we stand by ourselves, not necessarily pure. But if you graft yourself onto the tree of the Jewish people, you become purified like the young branch of the two-year-old tree, which is grafted onto the older tree. And he says, like the water of the mikvah, which attaches to the kosher, or to the pure water, also becomes purified. So too the Jewish people. A Jew who, and he says, that's why, the Meshachim says, that's why the custom is to be stringent about charity and kindness. Why? Because those are the two mitzvahs that do what? They connect you. If I'm stringent about being more kosher than usual, that doesn't connect me to anyone. If I'm more stringent about keeping Shabbat, it doesn't connect me. If I'm more stringent about my tefillin, it doesn't connect me. But if I'm stringent about giving and kindness and helping and smiling and charity and soccer, etc., what does that do? That connects me and grafts me on to the trunk of the Jewish people. And the more connected I am, and it's almost like I'm connected to God, because the Jewish people are always, as a, as a community, we're always connected to the divine presence. As individuals, not necessarily. 
But if the individual is connected in hundreds of ways to the community, because I do kindness and sadaka and charity and hospitality and this and that, but what is it doing? It's connecting me to the community. The Rambam, Maimonides, says a shocking thing. In the laws of Truva, which the rabbi has been teaching you, so you probably remember this, chapter 3, the Rambam says this. He lists all the different categories of heretics. I know you remember that, right? The categories of heretics. There's, there's minimum. There are five types of guys who are considered, who deny God, deny God's oneness, deny God's incorporeality, and so on and so forth. Then you've got guys who are called apikorosi. I'll give you some names afterwards. But an apikorus is basically a person who denies central principles about the Torah from heaven, and about prophecy, and so on and so forth. And then there's another category called a mumar. What does the word mumar literally mean? Anyone translate it? Mumar. Uh, mumar. No, that, that's mum. Mumar, with a ratio at the end, is an apostate. An apostate is someone who's taken on another religion. The Jew who became a Christian, or a Jew who became a Muslim, whatever, and he's, a, he's a mumar, an apostate. The Rambam, Maimonides, gives us one of the cases of mumar that the Rambam mentions is the strangest thing. He says this, a Jew who keeps mitzvot, keeps the commandments, does not transgress sins. That sounds very impressive. I wish that could be said about me. Right? Doesn't transgress any sins and does all the mitzvot. That's quite impressive. The Rambam says, however, he does it all by himself. He does not rejoice when the community rejoices. He does not mourn when the community mourns. He does not pray and cry and laugh and celebrate and mourn with the Jewish community. He does it by himself. He's a fruit guy. He's got, he only eats food which has got, in which the Hesher, the Rav, who gives the, the certification, has multiple Alice and Ains in his name, long to his spelling, the, 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 the Rav of who knows what, etc. He only, only eats overlap, but I have OU and Chafke and Star K, all combined, and a, some unknown Hasidic rabbi from Williamsburg also has to sign on this. Otherwise, he will lie to And on Shabbos, there is not a neighbor in the world that he will rely upon. And his film are huge, uh, and so on and so forth. However, and so he seems quite from very religious, very impressive. Right. And yet, the Rambam calls him an apostate. He's a, it's, a, it's a religion that look quite, it looks quite similar to Judaism, yes. But you can't have Judaism without the Jews. And if he's out there by himself, keeping Torah, keeping mitzvahs, but he's doing it by himself, he's not part of the community, he's not connected, it's like he's keeping a different religion. That's what the Raman says. He's a woman, an apostate. He may as well be a Catholic, may as well be a Muslim. Why? Because what he's keeping, although it looks like Judaism, tastes like Judaism, but it's not Judaism. Judaism is being part of the Jewish people as well. And that is an essential and central component. And on Rosh Hashanah, when we are being judged and evaluated, I don't want to be judged and evaluated as a loner. I'm part of the community. And that's how we look at it. And therefore, the Jewish people have a custom to do actions like tzedakah, like chesed, like kindness, like like Hafnasazorim, well, why? Because every single one of those is like, it's another, it's another hook that attacks me to the community. It's another piece of duct tape that hooks me up. It's my, I like duct tape, it's my, my home, home repairs, the better theory of home repairs. If it moves and it shouldn't, duct tape. If it doesn't move and it should, WD-40. And by the way, the same works with children. Right, so, um, but again, there's the idea, but every, every mitzvah of that sort that I do, I'm connecting myself even more to the Jewish people. And the more connected I am, the soich ami, anochi yosheret, betoch ami, anochi yosheret, who I'm, I'm dwelling amongst my, I'm dwelling amongst my people. It's an amazing thing. And by the way, Jewish people, we, we do feel that unity, you know, we try, I was in, um, I was in China two years ago, uh, leading a tour of China, and um, we, uh, I was walking with a group. We had about 60, uh, 60 Jews from New York and Chicago, uh, mostly, uh, I mean, all religious Jews in their average age 60s. And there's 60 of us 
and we're in Shanghai in the Imperial Tea Gardens. We stood out a little bit. You can have, you know, 60, 60 <laughs> fruit juice, New York, right? I mean, we were the loudest group there, first of all, right? Uh, I mean, there are, there are 1.3 billion Chinese, uh, sorry, whatever it is, Chinese, 2 billion Chinese. We, we probably make more noise. Than my, but anyway, <laughs> but <laughs> as we walk along, we see another group of people who are not Chinese walking towards us. They had a vaguely Israeli look about them. And I thought to myself, huh, looks like Israelis. And as they come close to us, all the Israelis, non-religious Israelis, they all burst into a round of the worst Jewish song ever written, Havana Gila. <laughs> Remember, I was at a subway station in, uh, in Manhattan, and there's a guy down there playing his violin. He was playing Mozart, Ein Kleiner Nach music, which I was enjoying greatly. And I turn around to see if the train's coming, and he sees my yarmulke and switches to half on a gill. <laughs> <laughs> I said to him, I was going to give you a buck, you're not getting anything, you anti Semite. Forget it. But the fact that these Israelis sung half on a gill was something which they wanted to, they, they're part of it, the, we're Jews, they're Jews, we're in the middle of Shanghai, right? So we feel connected. That's a beautiful thing. That's, that's, that's a connection. And that's something which we try to do. And I'll give you also uh, another explanation, which is that of Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi. Although before I get to Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi, I should point out Rabbi Tzadaka Koen of Lublin, um, great Hasidic master, 19th century uh, Poland. And Rabbi Tzadaka Koen said the following. He said, you know, what's the shofar? The shofar is called the kol shofar. That means the voice of the shofar. He says, on the other hand, when we speak, that's called dibur. He says, the difference between call a voice and dibur speech is that dibur takes the voice and cuts it up into quantum units. Whereas the voice is just sound. If I go, ah, oh, that's just the voice. That's a call. If I say, if I'm speaking now, I'm taking my call and I'm, I'm type of modulating it, dividing it into, into, into phonetic, uh, 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 what are they called, phonemes or whatever, something like that, right, syllables, etc., etc. So he says, he says the sound represents, in a sense, unity much more than speech does. Even though normally we daven and we speak, but he says there's a much greater sense of unity in the call, because what we hear in the shofar is a simple, simple sound. It's not complex stuff. Uh, even a good shofar blower uh, has a very limit to the amount that uh, he can improvise here. He's not going to, you know, he's not like going to do a, a jazz jam session. You know what I mean? That we're not going to, like the chazan and him are not going to be, you know, wrapping up there. Right? He, no, he's, he can do tzkia, shvarin druid, tzkia, that's it. That's it. Simple, simple sounds. And the Ritzalik kind says that actually represents the idea of the Jewish people in the united together and it's almost it's it's the it's a form of communal prayer when we listen to the shofar it's like we're all praying together much more than you know we we, we, we never really coordinate when we pray with your whole community no one's exactly on the same word uh, you know the same word we hopefully we're all on the same page but not ever, not necessarily so when do you actually get a prayer which we're literally everyone is absolutely synchronized 100% in their prayer, shofar. Even the Shema doesn't work that way. Because not everyone's doing the same pace, not everyone's doing the same nothing. But shofar, one person blows and we all listen. And that's all, that's a united voice of the Jewish people. There could not be a greater and more synchronized type of prayer coming from the depths of all the Jews together as there is in the case of the, of the shofar. I want to point out also that Yudali, in the Kuzari, uh, famous book of uh, philosophy, so Yudali, he points out, you probably are aware that prayer, according to the Rambam, it's a mitzvah of the Torah to pray every day. Nachmanides, the Rambam, disagrees. He says it's not a mitzvah to pray unless it's a time of stress or trouble. He says, it's a kindness that God allows us to communicate with him. And, okay, they have an argument, a famous argument. The Rambam saying it's a positive commandment, one of the 613 commandments to pray every day. The Rambam saying it's a kindness of God that he allows us to approach him and he answers us and he listens to us, but it's not per se of the Torah mitzvah, it's a rabbinic mitzvah. 
However, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi has an intermediate view. Rabbi Yehuda Halevi says that you know when it's a mitzvah of the Torah to pray? When you're praying with the community. If you're praying by yourself, that is a rabbinic fulfillment of this commandment. But when you're praying with the community, that's actually what the Torah really means. And that's why if you look at our prayers, they all end, so many of our prayers, they end with the, with the, uh, with the syllable nu. That's not a way, it's not like nu, it is a nu, right? That's not, no. But nu in the sense of, of, of first person plural. Right? Anach nu, anu, rafa'enu, slachlanu, plural, plural, plural. We always talk about the other and about us, we, all of us. Even when we confess our sins, we say ashamnu, we are guilty, right? Chatanu, etc. You know, you look at the list of al khayt I'm sure there are some there where you look at and say, I, I didn't do that, pretty sure. I, I didn't do it. But, but we're doing it as part of the Jewish people. Oh, although one of my kids said, he says, you know, it's, you know it's, been a, it's, it's been somewhat of a year when you go through the list of confession of al khayt and you say, hey, they missed a bunch. I'm just like, whoa, right? But I guess it has to be updated at some point. I did suggest to Art Scroll uh, that, 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 that we should do an illustrated al khayt But they did not think that would contribute to our uh, concentration during davening. I said, what are you kidding? You could Photoshop. You could sell, you may want to make, you could Photoshop people's faces into the pictures. And you could look in the mouth, and you could see yourself doing the Alfaira. Oh, my gosh, I guess. Right, so, but they again they rejected that amongst my other excellent ideas. Okay, but you know, lady says that is really the ideal form of prayer is when you're with the community. And I want to end with just a one of the most beautiful uh, uh, poetic verses that I have heard. I, I, I really, it was uh, from Rav uh, Shlomo Ibn Gviro, the great Spanish Jewish poet. As you know, the Jews of Spain. Uh, were famous for their poetry, both secular and religious poetry, and uh, we have uh, many, many of the greatest, greatest Jewish poems come from the community, medieval Jewish community of Spain. The earliest zmira that we have, the oldest zmira we have singing on Shabbos, is a zmira by Dunash ibn Labret called Drori Kra Levanian Bat in Sachem. His name is a sign as an acrostic there. When we Sheva Bracha, we start with Dvei Haser. Begam Charon, also from Dunash ibn Labret. Right? And we have some beautiful poems, but one of the lines, there's a great poem, Keter Malchut, which the Sparim, I believe, the Eidot HaMizrach recite on Yom Kippur, or Shoma ibn Gvirol. And there's a line there that says this, Evrach mimcha eilecha, esater mechamatcha b'tzilecha. Which means, Evrach mimcha eilecha, I'll run away from you, towards you. Esater mechamatcha, I will hide from your anger, but silecha in your shade. It, it, the, the, the Hebrew is better than the English, but, but you get the gist. I'll run away from you towards you. I will, there's actually a, um, if you, anyone has read Miyamoto Musashi's Book of the Five Rings, one of the greatest Japanese sword fighters ever lived. So in his book of sword fighting, one of the things he says is that one of the techniques of defense against the sword is to run towards the opponent and to block it when he is, uh, not when he's all the way through his swing, but when he's just at the beginning of his swing, so you run towards him and, and block it. So those who are interested in sword fighting, we can discuss it later. Uh, but uh, probably Ibn Firol was probably not referring to the Amata Musashi Book of the Five Rings. But what he was referring to was, I think, what I've been discussing now. Evrach mimcha, how do you run away from the anger of God? You can't escape the anger. You can't escape judgment. You cannot escape the criticism. We cannot escape the critique or the evaluation. So where do we run? There's nowhere to run on this world away from God. But where can you run? Towards God. And there's nowhere to escape his anger except in his shade. In his under under his under his the shade, so to speak, of the divine presence. So Evrach mincha elecha, I'll run away from you towards you. Esater mitzul mechamatcha, I'll hide from your anger but silecha in your shade. And how do you do that? How do we run towards Hashem? The answer is we run towards His people. How do we hide from His anger? In the shade of the Jewish people. 
the toch ami anochi yoshevitz, anything that we can do during this period of time, of Elul, of Rosh Hashanah, of the 10 days of repentance, Yom Kippur, etc. And the truth is the whole year, but especially now, anything we can do that connects ourselves to the Jewish people more, that connects one Jew to another Jew, that connects us to Jews who might not exactly look like me, no, not necessarily everyone's not, not, not everyone's handsome, but, but you know, uh, or has a beautiful accent, right? But, but we to connect to other Jews, in that way, we are running away towards Hashem. We are hiding from the anger in the, in the shade of the divine presence which rests on the Jewish people. That, I think, is the central lesson of El, and that is why Elul is alluded to, Ani l'dodi v'dodi li, I am to my beloved, my beloved is to me, Maybe it's not talking only about us and Hashem as a beloved. Maybe it's talking about our fellow Jew as well. And when it says in Megillah says there, as an allusion to Elul, when it says there, right, each person to his friend and gifts to the poor, it is clear now why that alludes to Elul, because that is really the essence of it, that a person should connect to others connect to each other and to create that unity in which A is the divine need of the Jewish people. As we said, Chefzei, Sibur, the needs of the community are the needs of God. As the Tanya said, the perfect utensil for the divine presence is a utensil which is one. The Jewish people, when we are one, we become the dwelling place for the divine presence. As the Mesha Chochma said, when we graft ourselves onto the trunk of the old and ancient tree of the Jewish people, even if you are Orla, even if we are not ideal, but we graft ourselves onto the trunk, Yalda, the young one, is Nithara, is purified by the elder, by the Jewish people. And as Ramuda Levi said, that's really the ideal form of prayer as we know it. As Rav Cook says, it's really, that's, the, that's why we need windows to think about other people. And so therefore, and this is what the Shunamit woman said to Elisha, I'm dwelling amongst my people. The more that we feel that people are dwelling amongst us, we're dwelling amongst each other, we're reaching out to other people, we are creating connections and we are encouraging connections. The more we do that, we are fulfilling Ani Ladodi, Vadodi Li, I'm to my beloved, Israel Matan Yoyim, and we fulfill Evrach Mimcha Elecha, I run away from you towards you, and we hide from your anger, but silecha in your shah. That's the lesson of Elul. We should hopefully all have a ksiba v'chasima tova, a happy, uh, a sign and seal for life, and a happy and sweet new year for us, for all of Israel, and for the whole world. And thank you very much for listening. Amen. Um, thank you so much, Rabbi Becher. I, wonderful words of inspiration. I think in our shul, Bar Hashem, we can take some pride in that we have, uh, more than most places, a community of Ashkenazim and Sephardim who are here tonight again, and uh, joining together. But we certainly have a long way to go in not only having our community, but uh, reaching out to the community around us in Bar Hashem, and we look forward to that. Um, we, uh, I forgot that you're also into martial arts. He used to be. <laughs> no, 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 challenge, no challenges tonight. I'm a little, <laughs> little out of practice. I, I did want to mention, uh, I, 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 I said he'll take a few questions, but I just wanted to mention that tonight's lecture was sponsored um, by several individuals who have helped contribute. Ellen Kaufman uh, to the uh, author and Fern Sisser, Alan and Judy Heimowitz, and a, an anonymous sponsor. And we thank them very much for their uh, help. <laughs> I also wanted to mention once again that Rabbi Becher's book is for sale. Rabbi Becher's book is actually an excellent book if you ever want a book that you can hand somebody who's not religious as a basic book to learn about Judaism. It's, it's a beautiful book to hand them, and it's you know, very, very appropriate. So if anybody has any questions, I... Even if you're deeply religious, the book is helpful. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> don't know, discourage people. Yeah. Any uh, questions? Uh, heckling, alternate speeches, insults, political statements, endorsements? Uh, no, no, okay. Oh, sorry, yeah. Rabbi, how do you explain the fact that the greatest teacher Moses would spend time by himself with the camp for 120 days? Why wasn't he? 
That's a good question. Although, uh, what we'd have to say is that uh, Moses was the one who was responsible for bringing the Torah down to earth and for creating the Jewish people in the sense that our nation is a nation only by virtue of its Torah. So he needed to be isolated with him and Hashem in order to absorb that Torah, to bring it to the Jewish people. But once he did that, he was devoted to the Jewish people for the rest of his life. He had to do that. Sometimes we have ideas that a person has to separate. They may have to, you know, a guy, I mean, God forbid if a soldier has to go on a lone mission, which is important for the whole Jewish people, important for the Israel, you cannot say, look at this guy separating from the Jews. No, he's, he's on the way to, to do something which is essential and vital. Moshe Rabbeinu was doing something vital for the Jewish people. It required his temporary separation from the Jewish people. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Have a uh, good convention, and Shana Tovah. Good to come.